There are six inscribed attic funerary monuments in the Fitzwilliams collection, and by good chance they include good representative examples of six different styles. Private Athenian funerary commemoration between the later 5th century BC and the Roman period falls into three stylistic phases. The first, from around 430 to 310 BC, is characterised by figurative sculpture, which typically depicts the deceased alone or in the presence of others, usually family members, with inscribed names and occasionally verse epigrams. As with some other types of commemorative monument, there was a tendency for them to become more numerous and elaborate as time progressed, and during the period in which Demetrius of Phaleron controlled Athens, 317-307 BC, he outlawed figurative monuments, and for three centuries and more after this, the characteristic form of Attic funerary monument was the simple column grave marker, known as a columella or chioniscos, inscribed with the name of the deceased and with no figurative representation. From the late 1st century BC onwards, there was a revival of the figurative style, which endured through until the 3rd century AD. Each of these three phases, the classical, figurative phase, the Hellenistic, simple, column phase, and the revival of the figurative style of monuments in the Roman period, each of these three phases is represented in the Fitzwilliams collection. Before looking at the individual monuments, I'd like to emphasise three general points that will help us to read them correctly in their original contexts. First of all, like most Athenian funerary monuments in modern museums outside Greece, the monuments in the Fitzwilliam were collected mostly in the 19th century as individual prestige objects for their artistic, antiquarian and financial value. In their original setting, however, the monuments would not normally have stood alone, but would have belonged to an ensemble of different monument types, generally commemorating about three generations of the same family, arranged in a walled funerary enclosure, or peribolos, with burial plots at the back and monuments for display typically at the front of the peribolos, facing the street. All of the monuments might carry inscriptions, but they were not usually designed to be read individually, but as an ensemble which developed over time, as new monuments were added and existing monuments were modified, including by new inscriptions. The common use of inscribed funerary monuments in the modern West gives us an instinctive sense that we understand their significance. But while there is certainly some overlap between ancient Athenian and the modern Western, and particularly the Christian tradition, of funerary commemoration, the emphasis on naming, for example, is a feature of both traditions, there are also significant differences. Perhaps the most striking is that in Christian funerary monuments, religious symbolism, connected with belief in an afterlife, is common. In ancient Athenian practice, it's normally absent. Athenian funerary monuments are less concerned with the fate of the deceased after death and relations with the gods, and more with the commemoration of the deceased as they were in life and their relations with humans, usually family members. This is expressed above all in so-called dexiosis scenes, Scenes, that is, in which the deceased is portrayed shaking hands with somebody else. The question of what the handshake signifies, is it a gesture of greeting or of farewell, has been much discussed in the scholarly literature. 
as has the related question of identifying which of the people depicted on the monument is the deceased. Probably the answer to the first question is that the handshake doesn't necessarily signify specifically greeting or farewell, but like handshakes in the modern West, it's a gesture that can be used either on parting or on greeting, and what it signifies is a bond of intimacy between the two people. As for identifying the deceased, sometimes it's clear enough, but sometimes it isn't. It's almost as if the family unit and the relations between family members are more important than marking which family member is the deceased at any particular moment. And such is the nature of human life that before very long all the individuals portrayed will be deceased. The third point that I want to emphasise is that Athenian funerary monuments are preoccupied with status in two different ways. The first of which is again unfamiliar to our own tradition because in ancient Athens an ensemble of monuments in a funerary enclosure served in part a public purpose, displaying and confirming the family connections necessary for securing inheritance of property and the citizen descent that was necessary for citizen status. Finally, there is another aspect of status projection that is perhaps easier to relate to from a modern perspective. Quite commonly, an Athenian funerary monument is concerned to project high social status, whether conveyed simply via the high quality of the sculpture, or via elite status markers, such as ownership of horses or hunting dogs, by other indicators of culture or leisure conveyed visually, and sometimes also in an accompanying funerary epigram. Now let us look at the monuments in a little more detail. This is the earliest of the inscribed Attic funerary monuments in the Fitzwilliam, dating probably to about or a little after 400 BC, the aftermath of the Peloponnesian War. It's just under a metre high, and as you can see depicts a graceful scene of a young man unbearded to the left, shaking hands with an older bearded man to the right. The young man has a petasos, a broad traveller's hat, hanging at the back of his neck. He leads a horse by the bridle and is accompanied by a small slave boy and two hunting dogs, one of which looks straight ahead, while the other sniffs the ground in lifelike fashion, tail erect. The monument is in the shape of a lekythos, a type of ceramic vessel that typically contained oil associated with funerary rites and was commonly deposited in graves. From the later 5th century onwards, marble lekithoi were typically placed at the front corners of a funerary enclosure. The inscription on this monument isn't easy to see at first sight, but if we zoom in you can see some lettering. Over the head of the older man, apparently naming him, Hagemone in the first line, Epike Physios in the second line, with the letters at the beginning of the lines more clearly legible than those at the ends. Hagemone is a man's name, and Epike Physios means from Epike Physia. Epikephysia was one of the 139 deems or villages of Attica, so the inscription means hegemon of Epikephysia. The inclusion of a deem name or demotic in his nomenclature marked a man out as an Athenian citizen. The name seems to be labelling the older man, 
to judge from its position. And yet the main focus of attention in the relief is the younger man. This presents the viewer with a puzzle that is quite commonly encountered with these monuments, that of distinguishing the living from the dead. In this case, several different theories have been proposed, the most persuasive of which is that the name label was added later, on the death of the older man, to a monument that originally commemorated the death of the younger one. The younger man might perhaps have been named on another monument in the enclosure. As also rather commonly in funerary reliefs, the relationship between the persons portrayed is also not entirely clear. It's perhaps easiest to see the older man as the father of the younger, but we can't rule out another relationship, for example grandfather and grandson. The name label tells us that this was a citizen family, but there is another aspect of status that seems to be deliberately projected by the graceful scene depicted on this high-quality monument. Namely the elite status, which was strongly associated in ancient Athens with horse ownership and hunting. We don't know anything else about Hegemon of Epike Physio or his family, but this monument was clearly intended to convey a message that the family was leisured and well-to-do. The second monument is a bit taller than the first, one and a quarter metres high approximately, and has the form of a stele. But depicted in relief in the lower section of the stele is another type of ceramic vessel that was used in a funerary context, the lutrophoros. In life, lutrophoroi conventionally carried water for wedding rites, in death they were placed on the tombs of persons who had died unmarried, the idea being that the deceased should receive in death what they had not obtained in life. Sometimes, like the Lekythos we discussed earlier, the monument takes the form of a three-dimensional Lutrophoros. Quite commonly, however, as here, the Lutrophoros is depicted in relief on a stele and the relief Lutrophoros is itself decorated with figurative scenes in a style similar to that typically found on other forms of funerary monument, including the characteristic handshake Dexiosis. In this case, the scene depicts to the left a clothed, young, beardless man with a dog sniffing the ground, shaking hands with a naked youth to the right, with a dog whose head is turned up to look at him. It was not uncommon for deceased males on Lutrophoroi, as here, to appear naked, which seems to have been an allusion to their unmarried status, and the deceased is also singled out by being the focus of his dog's attention. The date of this monument is probably slightly later than the first one, we are around 380 to 350 BC. In this case, the name of the deceased is inscribed on the upper moulding of the stele, and it's followed by a verse epigram inscribed on the panel below. Here is a translation. On the upper moulding, Euthikritos of Aetia. And then in the panel above the relief, the epigram. Here the land of his fathers covered in a tomb one who had reached the goal of every excellence, Euthikritos, beloved of his mother and father, missed both by his sisters and by all the companions of his youth, with whom he had grown up. The deceased Demotic, at the top of the stele, probably Aetios, from Aetia, 
actually presents a puzzle, because only the end of it is clearly preserved, and it looks as if there was either a mistake in the original inscription or the demotic has been tampered with later. One possibility is that the tampering was done by someone who wanted to cast doubt on Euthycritos' citizen status, but we can't be sure. Euthycritos' name, without Demotic, is also included in line 5 of the epigram. The epigram begins, however, with a conventionally worded indication that the deceased lies here in his native soil which in effect confirms the message about citizen status implicit in the use of the deceased demotic on the epistyle. A significant minority of classical Athenian funeral monuments carry epigrams. An epigram was clearly an optional extra. Some poetic skill and ingenuity were needed to adapt the name and other wording of the epigram, both to the circumstances of the deceased and to the exigencies of the metre, Though the epigrams tend to dwell in conventional terms on the deceased's attainment of normative behavioural ideals, as in this case their all-round excellence, arete, and the grief and loss occasioned by the death of the loved one, in this case the father and mother, who are clearly still living, and in what seems to be a personal touch, sisters in the plural, but no brothers. Instead of brothers, the epigram refers to youthful companions. The wording has the effect of focusing attention on the fact that the deceased was the father's sole male heir, heightening the poignancy of the message conveyed by the Lutrophoros form, namely that he had died unmarried. A fact that will also have had implications for inheritance rights, as I mentioned earlier. Despite the personal touches, to a marked degree epigrams such as this seem intended to convey the same messages of attainment of respectable ideals and strong family bonds that are projected by the figurative aspects of the monument. Interplay between the epigram and the figurative aspects of these monuments is not especially common, but in this case the fact that both the figures in the relief are youthful in appearance and both accompanied by a dog, may suggest that the figure on the left represents the companions of the deceased youth, alluded to also in the epigram. Unlike the first monument that we considered, there are no horses in this case to signify elite status. But the high quality of the monument, the leisured impression conveyed by the relief and the epigram with its allusion to the elite virtue of arete seem designed to convey a similar impact on the viewer. The third monument is preserved only in its upper middle section, and it depicts a bearded man with his right hand reaching up to his cap, pilos in Greek, labelled by an inscribed name above him on the moulding, Theocles, or possibly Neocles. It probably dates to around the first quarter of the 4th century, so about the same period as the first two monuments we looked at. From the shape of the pediment, it can be calculated that the figure of the man occupied the whole width of the stone without architectural framing at the sides. How should we interpret the man's enigmatic gesture? Scholars have made various suggestions that it's a straightforward gesture of mourning or that he's donning his cap in readiness for the longest journey of all or that he was a warrior for whom warfare is now over and who is thus removing his cap. I'm not sure that any of these interpretations is quite right. Precisely the same gesture is attested on another funerary monument for a seated figure, where it responds to a standing figure who is holding out his hand to the seated man, apparently offering to shake hands. <laughs> 
This suggests to me that the gesture of the man reaching to his hat in our monument is a gesture of greeting or preparatory to greeting, not perhaps unlike raising one's hat in modern culture. And perhaps there was another monument close by depicting a figure with whom our deceased was interacting. In any case, this enigmatic gesture, together with the use of the man's name only, without his father's name or his demotic or other identifier, emphasises the importance of reading these funerary monuments as part of an ensemble in a funerary enclosure, which would in this case have clarified his identity and relationships. By itself, the monument presents a puzzle. As part of a monumental ensemble, its significance was probably quite clear. The first three monuments we've been looking at belong to the classical period. The first of the three stylistic phases that we noted at the beginning of this talk. Our fourth monument, which comes from the port of Athens, the Piraeus, is a classic example of the second phase of Attic funerary commemoration, which endured for three centuries following the legislation of Demetrius of Phaleron at the end of the 4th century BC. It's a typical example of the simple funerary columella that was characteristic of Hellenistic Athens. Completely lacking in figurative decoration, it's inscribed only with the name of the deceased. She was Cleopatra, daughter of Gorgias, of Beritos, a Phoenician city equivalent to the modern Beirut. As simple monuments whose basic design remained the same over a long period, they are difficult to date. But in this case we can link the deceased to the commercial community from Beirut which we know flourished on Delos and at Athens in the late 2nd century BC. The island of Delos was an important commercial centre in the Hellenistic period, and thanks to Roman patronage, between 166 BC and 86 BC, it was under Athenian control. On Delos at this period, the traders from Beirut formed an association known as the Poseidonias of Beirut. Their headquarters on the island has been excavated and can be visited still today. Delos was the major source of wealth for the Athenian elite at this period, and it was common for both Athenian citizens and non-citizens engaged in commerce to divide their time between Athens and Delos. Two men named Gorgias are known from Delos at this period, and Cleopatra was probably daughter of one of them. Funerary commemoration in Hellenistic Athens was characterised by the columella, inscribed simply with the name of the deceased, as in the example we've just looked at. When in the late 1st century BC the figurative style was revived, the columella continued to be made but could now, as here in this monument from the city of Athens, be decorated with relief sculpture. This one, which probably dates to the 1st century AD, shows a relief depicting a long-haired man framed by an archway, his head slightly turned to the right. As quite commonly with Attic funerary monuments, the head of the figure has been deliberately defaced, this was often due to iconoclasts in late antiquity. Under the figure you can see a dog in outline bounding up towards his master. At this period, this motif seems always to have marked out the deceased as a young man or ephebe. The inscription reads, 
Euclidas, son of Euclidas, of Hermione. Hermione was a small coastal city of the southern Argolid. Just two men from it are attested as residents of Attica between the 6th and 3rd centuries BC, both cultural figures known from the literary record, and this is one of four Attic funerary monuments for citizens of Hermione dating from the 1st century BC to the 3rd century AD, and the only one with figurative relief. Our final funerary monument in the Fitzwilliams collection dates to about a century later, so around 150 to 200 AD, and it portrays a youngish woman facing out towards the viewer, and on the right in smaller scale, a young long-haired servant girl gazing sadly up at the deceased, holding her head in her right hand in a gesture of grief with her right elbow resting on her left hand. On the left, there is a kithara, a lyre. The inscription reads, Aphrodisia, also known as Epilampsis, daughter of Aphrodisios of Leuconion. We saw earlier that status was a perennial concern with Attic funerary monuments and there are two points about the status of the deceased in this case that are particularly interesting. On the one hand, Aphrodisia is portrayed as a dignified young woman being mourned by a young servant girl and the leading authority on the figurative monuments of Roman Attica interprets the lyre which appears by her side as a mark of culture and education. On the other hand, it does not appear that Aphrodisia was married, and the other two females accompanied on their funerary monuments at this period by musical instruments are not Athenian citizens, and, as with Aphrodisia, an alternative possibility is that all three of these women were professional musicians. The second enigmatic feature of this monument is that the deceased went by two names, as we learn from the inscription, Aphrodisia, also known as Epilampsis. What's going on here? Well, we can't be sure, but one possibility is that the two names were a consequence of a naming strategy aimed at securing inheritances. The name Aphrodisia would perhaps have been intended to secure inheritance rights from her father, Aphrodisios, while the alternative name, Epilampsis, might have been designed to secure her, or perhaps somebody else's, inheritance via another route. 